So a little bit about TCM. So we've been around uh, for 14 years. So we're the, by, by a long way, the, the longest standing and most well-established uh, mediation business in the UK. We, we help organisations, employees, leaders, teams, organisations just like yours achieve their full potential by removing the barriers that we can see so frequently happening when people experience conflict, when they're not reacting positively to change, and when communication breaks down. Our core services around employee and industrial relations. For example, we provide the industrial relations and employee relations support to Royal Mail Group amongst, uh, amongst many other organisations. And we set up integrated resolution schemes in organisations. I'll talk more about what that means, but our core focus is taking the skills that we use as mediators and embedding them into the organisations with which we work. And that's very much about changing the culture, um, the philosophy of the organisations with whom we work. So we have a full-time team of mediators supported by a world-leading team of associates and we're also accredited by Customer First, if you're familiar with that, a very robust and thorough accreditation process ensuring we have the customer at the centre of everything that we do as a business. So what, what are Richard and I going to be focusing on today, some of the challenges that we'll be looking at? Well, I think the first one I've, I've talked a little bit about already is the change in landscape of dispute resolution in the UK. Now, whatever our views are in relation to access to justice, and I know that's a political hot potato right now, and will continue to be, you know, in relation to Osborne's cuts uh, to the public sector, and, that, that, and, and certainly legal services uh, are going to be affected by that too. But in terms of the focus on mediation, there's never been a better time to be a mediator in this country, because the focus, whether it's from the government or from organisations or from well, elsewhere in society, is a recognition that going to court is a sign of failure. It's the least best place to resolve our issues. The focus increasingly is on local or early resolution, resolving problems before they escalate, not when they become a source of income and revenue, in essence, for the legal profession getting issues nipped in the bud and resolved at an earlier stage. The main focus of that in terms of alternative dispute resolution, ADR, is mediation. There are various strands to ADR, and we'll touch on some of these today. Adjudication, arbitration, conciliation, and mediation are just a, a, a four of the ones that are most widely known. We're going to focus particularly today on the role of mediation. Mediation is still widely misunderstood and uh, I guess one of the, the greatest benefits of mediation is it happened behind closed doors. One of its biggest weaknesses, it happens behind closed doors and people may not be so familiar with what actually happens in the room. And I'll hopefully open the door to mediation today and show you what happens in that room and demystify it a bit and help you dem and demonstrate some of the values and the benefits of that approach. I think as a mediator, uh, working with increasing numbers of organisations who want to have an evidence-based approach, what's the evidence of the need to change? And we'll be sharing with you some ideas and thoughts about how you can assess the potential impact and benefits of mediation and also assess the real impact of conflict to your organisation or to your members' organisations. And finally, we'll look at how you can embed an effective dispute resolution approach within your organisation and offer it as a service, as a benefit to your members um, within, within your organisation. So here we are a scrap, a fight, a disagreement, and how familiar are we with this? And look, they're not talking, they're shouting at each other, arms are raised. You can just imagine this happening in any organisation, office, um, workplace, up and down the land, maybe it's a, com a complaint from a consumer or elsewhere. And unfortunately, in this particular situation, as with many different disputes, the two parties have a right slanging match, they go to their various corners, they lick their wounds, they fume, they fume, they're fed up, they're feeling angry, they're feeling cross. So how do we move from that position of fear, anger, cross, fed up, frustrated and sad to a point where these two people might be willing to get into a room together? Well, I think the first one is to recognise that we respond to conflict in a particular way. The fight or flight, freeze or fall, or response, as it's known. The release of powerful hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. Our perception of that we're right, that you're wrong, that I, should, I'm, I, I win, you lose. I don't trust you. Who do you think you are? You're a bully. What we're doing here is adopting a position which forms a polarity between us. I'm right, you're wrong. And the problem with our existing dispute resolution systems is it actually encourages that polarity because our existing dispute resolution systems are binary in nature. They, do, they require someone to be right and someone to be wrong. So it can come as no surprise that very early in a conflict, we start to perceive ourselves as being right or wrong. 
And of course, because of the fight or flight response, I'm right, you're wrong. And in actual fact, I know I'm not right all the time, but if I sit down and have a conversation with you, I might perceive that in some respects, you'll demonstrate that I'm not right. You will attack me. I will perceive that as an attack. So I will defend myself against that de attack. And what's the best form of defense? Attack. So what often happens in this polarity situation or this binary situation driven by these strong hormones, driven by our perceptions of effective dispute resolution or justice, is the actual fact we have a cycle of defend and attack that plays out. And then someone tries to get these two parties in a room together and of course it just blows up, it kicks off, someone walks out, someone starts crying, someone bangs the table. It becomes very difficult to manage. But why is that? What's at the heart of all of this stuff that's going on. Well, in order to be able to resolve a conflict, we need to understand what conflict really is. The problem with dispute resolution, as I see it for a great many organizations, is we perceive conflict as a series of behaviors which are a clash, a confrontation. And we develop policies and procedures in our organizations which address these behaviors, grievance procedures, discipline procedures, complaint procedures, performance procedures, attendance procedures, capability procedures. And all of these procedures exist to address the behaviours that we see happening in our organisation. The problem with those is they don't take account of what's really going on beneath the surface. Now, when I was talking to a lady in conflict very recently, she said to me, what I need, David, she was angry and she was fed up and she wanted to leave the business. What she said she needed was an explanation of why she'd been treated that way. She needed someone to listen to her and she needed to be taken seriously and valued. But this wasn't in, in embedded in the policy. The policy didn't care about what her needs were. The policy cared about whether or not she was behaving in an appropriate manner. So I asked her, so I said, tell me more about this. How does it feel when those needs aren't being met? I feel vulnerable, isolated. I've lost confidence. I've lost esteem. What's the point of coming into work? She said to me, I've got bricks in my belly coming into the workplace. A loss of a sense of future or hope. Now, of course, Martin Seligman, the, the psychologist, the founder of the School of Positive Psychology, he tells us that in actual fact, when we have a loss of control in our lives, that's one of the biggest causes of stress and anxiety for us as human beings. So at the heart of the conflict, there's a loss, and it's that loss that drives the emotional and psychological responses, the fight, flight, freeze, or fall responses that release of adrenaline. And that impacts on the way that we act, interact, and react to each other, the air within which the dispute or the conflict occurs. And that drives the behavior. And as a mediator, when I'm working with the parties and starting to understand the wider narrative of the conflict, what's really going on for you right now, and what's going on for the other person right now, miracles happen. And one of the miracles of dispute resolution that I perceive is that when one party tells me that they need to be respected, valued, taken seriously, heard, treated with dignity and respect, the other person tells me exactly the same. And what mediation does is it allows the parties to recognize that they have shared interests, shared needs, shared goals, shared aspirations, a shared sense of humanity. What our existing dispute resolutions processes unfortunately do is they impede that notion of a shared experience. And therefore, they dull or impede the opportunity for a meaningful resolution to occur. And the, 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 the need for change is compelling. I mean, we, there's data, uh, enormous amount of data, that so the CBI has talked about £30 billion a year lost to the UK economy uh, in relation to these issues. From a human resources perspective, 370 million working days a year are lost, according to the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development. So what is the cost of this to your members? And these are questions really to be thinking about for the future. How much time is being taken to resolve these issues? Again, uh, recent evidence again from the CIPD suggests that 30% of managers' time is spent dealing with these issues. At the, the Centre for Dispute Resolution, it often comes in thirds, said a third of managers would sooner jump out of an aeroplane for the first time than deal with a problem in the workplace. So HR is spending time, leaders are spending time, in organisations, we're seeing a significant impact in people staying with the organisation. They leave. There's a recruitment and absent cost. The legal fees, those are eye-wateringly high for many organisations. You know, on the front page of the Evening Standard, almost every evening, there is a dispute in a workplace or between a divorcing couple or between neighbours where they've taken it through the courts and it's costing tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds. 
What a waste of money. What a waste of time. Is it really resolving the issues? It's not. Is it giving a perception of justice? No, it's not. But it seems to be the remedy that we are, for whatever reason, constantly focusing on. The engagement, the levels of engagement and satisfaction of your customers, of your members' customers, of your employees, your members' employees. I'm a member of, a pro, uh, of an organisation called Engage for Success, and I, 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 I do a lot of work around employee engagement. And my experience of, of conflict and the breakdown of trust is the breakdown of trust is the antithesis of customer engagement or employee engagement. So if we don't resolve these issues effectively, how can we build long-term relationships with our customers and with each other? It impacts on our health and well-being, and of course, ultimately, on our reputation. Who wants to be on the front page of the Evening Standard? with their case being dragged through the courts, costing tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds. BT certainly didn't want to. BT approached us and said, look, David, we want to do things differently. So they chose to opt for mediation as an alternative to their formal approaches. And Carol Russell, the former head of employee relations at BT Retail, says very passionately, everyone wins with mediation, no one loses. That's a really important message. In Royal Mail, another large organisation, just shy of 100% of all cases that are coming through to mediation have been refer, ref, resolved through mediation. It's about 97% of cases. Prior to that, there was no meaningful vehicles for people to resolve these issues. And suddenly, in a short space of time, almost 100% of cases are resolved by talking and listening. It doesn't surprise me, Richard, because at the end of the day, when we sit down and talk and listen to each other, it's the best way of getting understanding. And if our need is for understanding, how can we possibly achieve that through a formal process? So we're going to run our first of our two polls now. And uh, we, we, it's, a, it's a question. So what impact does conflict have in your organisation? So um, I'm going to open up the poll now and launch the poll. Um, so what impact does it have? You'll have a series of boxes. You can, you can tick as many um, of the boxes in front of you as you wish. It'd just be interesting to see what your experience is. So there's increased stress. There's no increased cost. Does it impact on productivity? Is there a damage to the reputation? Does it cause a relationship breakdown? So if you click on the, um, uh, the, the answer, which you think, or answers, which you think represents the, um, the cost of conflict or the impact of conflict to your organization. Okay, so we've had 17% so far. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to keep the poll open for another 10 seconds. So if you haven't voted yet, this is an opportunity to do so. Five, four, three, two, one. So I'm going to close that poll. And so you should see in front of you now the results of the poll. So 25% of you felt that conflict was creating an increase in stress. 25% perceive that we've seen a reduction in productivity. Obviously, productivity is a massive issue for, for, for us at the moment, a big focus for the government. And 50% of attendees today see that it's having an impact on relationship breakdowns. And I think that would be very much similar to a great many organisations' experiences. And it's having a negative and damaging effect on a great many organisations. So thank you very much for that poll. Um, what I'd like to do now is invite you, if you have any questions, to uh, answer, to ask us any questions. Like I said, there's a questions box in front of you there. Um, if you do have any questions, then feel free to do so. Like I say, we've got more questions that we're going to be bringing. Um, and so unless there's any questions, then we will move on. Okay, and I'll come back to any that are asked uh, in due course. So let's move on to mediation and think about mediation um, as an approach for dispute resolution. Uh, I'm sure many of you here will have heard of mediation and, and have some insight into it, but I'd like to just talk through the process before I hand over to Richard to talk about his um, uh, perception of this from, from member-wise. I think the important thing uh, here is, <laughs> someone did point out a flaw with this uh, quote recently, Richard, if everyone's listening, does anyone actually talk? Um, I suppose it, working on the basis that, that people are talking and listening, but every good conversation starts with good listening. And my experience of conflict resolution is we begin to listen very badly. We listen to defend ourselves. We listen to the first 10% of what someone says, 
and spend the next 90% of what they're saying preparing our response. And what we do in mediation is we're listening for meaning. And that's a really important message here in terms of the nature of mediation. It's about talking and listening. Mediation is now widely um, recognized as management HR leadership best practice. There's an increasing rec recognition of the real cost of conflict. I just put three reports up here, uh, and I'll send these through to you after this seminar uh, today. So the Charter Institute of Personal Development um, published research earlier in the year in relation to the cost of conflict and the benefits of mediation. ACAS have done a detailed, the, um, the government's arbitration and conciliation service, done a detailed analysis of the role of mediation in a large NHS trust. Very, very interesting, very forensic level analysis. And Royal Mail are increasingly evaluating the benefits of mediation on both industrial relations and also on their employee relations activities. So mediation isn't just a tool of dispute resolution. It's about building engagement, well-being, driving performance, building customer care processes. Um, and really helping to uh, address some of the changes in um, our legal framework within the UK. In an employment setting, we've seen a real shift towards use of mediation, driven as far back as 2007 by a, a gentleman called Michael Gibbons, who in 2007 reviewed the current provision for dispute resolution in the UK and recommended a shift and a focus on mediation. We've seen a significant shift in the role and focus of mediation to the point now that you can't go to an employment tribunal without at least some form of a conciliation process being held. So the, media, the legal reforms, if we park the political issue around access to justice, the legal reforms are mediation friendly. And of course, later this year, we'll be seeing the emergence of the ADR directive, which, we, which provides for, uh, provision for increasing use of mediation in consumer disputes, um, which I'm sure will be of interest to a great many people here. Uh, just consumer disputes by qualified and accredited mediation professionals. So there's a significant shift in focus and drive towards the use of mediation. So what is mediation? Well, it's a non-adversarial way of resolving our issues. Mediation this is my tripartite definition of mediation. It's a mindset. So when I'm in a dispute, do I think about how we can go and resolve it and talk about it? Is it conciliatory or do I look for the fight? Am I looking to, to, to win? Am I lodging a grievance? Am I formalizing it? It's a framework, a process whereby a third party mediator intercedes into a dispute to help the parties find a, a successful, collaborative, sustainable outcome. But it's also a set of skills that we use every day in our lives, at home, at the dining room table, with our friends, with our families. They just seem to get parked at the front door of our offices when we walk into the workplace. Why is that? As I've suggested, perhaps some of our policies and procedures actually actively discourage common sense, I would suggest. Because all, mediation, after all, is simply the application of common sense. Unfortunately, common sense and trust are often seen doing a leap out of the open window uh, at the first sign of conflict. So the mediator, whoever it is, whether it's a manager, a leader, a business owner, an HR professional, of course, an external professional accredited mediator, the Kofi Annan-esque figure parachuting into a dispute zone, whatever they are, they're a neutral, impartial third party. Their role is to help the two or more parties have an open and honest conversation, helping them to identify an outcome which is acceptable to both parties based on their interests and needs, a win-win outcome. So it's about collaborating rather than blaming. And again, it just rolls off the tongue in the definition, but we're not used to this. This is not how we are taught to resolve our disputes. And critically in mediation, the agreement comes directly from the parties, not the third party. It's up to them to feel forged and craft their own solutions. We're not there to judge or tell the parties what they should or shouldn't do. Of course, mediation is both voluntary and confidential. Really important values and principles of mediation. We can't force people to mediate, but we can do a lot more to, to, to encourage them to do so. But what's said in mediation stays in mediation. And that's really important. It allows the parties to have an open, honest conversation with each other. And that's what a mediation looks like. I thought I'd just put a picture up, Richard, and show people what it is. That's it. That is a mediation process. There we have Claire, our mediator, with her pad. And I have, we have our two parties sat in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a conversation with each other. The way that the mediator works is they meet the parties separately uh, to allow the parties to talk in confidence with the mediator about their issues and their concerns. And the mediator listens carefully and asks lots of questions, as you would imagine. And once we've met the parties separately, we then bring them together in a joint meeting uh, where they can start to communicate with each other. 
The joint meeting is a very cleverly and carefully managed process. It starts quite artificial to begin with. We ask the parties to, engage, to, 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 to agree to a set of ground rules. We then ask the parties to talk to each other uninterrupted and uninhibited. Um, so we ask them to listen very carefully, which is an unusual way of communicating, I must say. But actually, it does allow issues to be surfaced that were perhaps underneath the surface. The mediator will summarise back what she's heard to the parties, and then we invite the parties to have a more free-flowing exchange. It's more a, a normalised conversation at this point. And the mediator's role is to facilitate that conversation, speed it up, slow it down, reflect it, summarise, check, clarify, probe. It's a fantastic process. And of course, as the mediation process um, continues, it moves more into a problem-solving stage. We move from past to present to future. So the questions that Claire will be asking here are, based on what you've heard each other say, what needs to happen tomorrow to resolve this issue? So it's a very powerful process. It allows the issues of the past to be talked about, but it's not about blame, it's about learning. We focus on where we are now, so we understand the narrative, the stories that the parties have. Very important, we use a lot of work around narrative and storytelling in our work as mediators. And it also is about um, collaborative, interest-based problem solving. It's not about pointing and attacking, it's about listening and trying to find a way forward. And there are enormous benefits, and it's almost impossible to list them all on one slide, but here's just a few. There are financial benefits, management time is reduced, levels of grievances and complaints can be reduced. And in some respects, it's not necessarily about the level of grievances and complaints being reduced, it's about the amount of time being spent on dealing with them. Um, you know, some, some organisations rightly see complaints as a fantastic and a very positive opportunity to get things right, to listen to the customer, to spend time identifying what's gone wrong and changing their systems and processes. And that's what mediation can assist with. If that's your kind of organisation, you may well benefit from mediation. But the amount of time spent investigating issues and reaching determinations, legal costs and absence and losing good people, that all starts to fall in line. Replaced by increased productivity, increased focus on interest-based problem-solving approaches, increased managerial competence and leadership, engagement, customer engagement, employee engagement, well-being goodwill and teamwork, and just people getting on a bit better, being happier in the workplace. I wrote a post uh, last week about the importance of happiness in the workplace, and it's one of my most popular posts. People clearly recognise it. That there's a direct link between people feeling happy and people feeling productive. So finally, just uh, before I do hand over to Richard, it's just the framework that we use as mediators here at TCM. It's our FAIR framework. It's facilitate, allow the parties to come together by building rapport and listening to them. Helping them to see each other's point of view, appreciative inquiry, focusing on the good stuff, not just on the bad, being innovative and creative in finding a solution, and ultimately reaching a resolution, resolving the problems. So mediation is drawing on a sort of solution-focused approach. Very powerful. Um, and believe it or not, it happens sometimes in only one day. And I've mediated in some incredibly talent challenging and incredibly entrenched positions where I got a phone call the next day, Richard, which was what on earth did you put in their coffin? <laughs> and that's what people say, because they can't believe it. It's very powerful. Richard, thank you so much for coming along today. Really appreciate Not it. Problem. And uh, I'm going to hand over to yourself uh, now for your presentation, really about some of the perspectives from MemberWise. So um, mm -hmm. uh, over to you now. Well, yes, yeah, so I, I suppose for the perspective of this webinar, um, you've given us a very clear and a concise overview on what the process is and what the benefits um, actually are. Yeah. Um, hopefully the perspective I can bring to, to the webinar is obviously kind of a so what. So, so what does it mean? What does that mean for membership organisations and associations? Mm -hmm. So b before I actually kind of get into that, uh, I'll just introduce myself. Um, as many of you know me, for the past 20 minutes I've been as quiet as I probably ever will be <laughs> within a formal uh, session. Um, but basically, um, I founded and I run the MemberWise Network, which is the leading network for membership and association professionals in the UK. And we represent about 3,800 individuals who work for around 1,000 membership organisations and associations. And they're made up of a real mix of professional bodies, trade associations, trade unions, um, and all sorts of, of, of other different bodies that represent kind of collectives of individuals or, or organisations. We provide practitioner-focused information and advice. Um, most of you hopefully have had a look at the website, memberwise.org.uk, where we've got a video channel, a blog, uh, we do our monthly e-updates, we've got our online networking group. 
Um, and the next key element of activity for the network will be our national web conference on the 4th of November. Um, so this is my plug. Please do take a look at that because if you're looking at doing stuff online, we're going to have a great day in the centre of town where we're going to talk about all things online. So from, from my perspective, um, when David invited the network to get involved with this webinar, um, I, I must admit uh, needed to educate myself on what the topic was all about. So if, if, if you're in the same position that I'm in, I thought the, this, the most sensible thing to do would be actually to take a look within the membership space and actually see exactly what mediation work is taking place. So I, I literally Googled it, if I'm honest, and I'm not going to pretend otherwise. Um, and one of the key membership bodies was the uh, Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. That came quite highly on the list. And as a professional membership body representing chartered surveyors, uh, they've got a dispute resolution service that's over 30 years old. So in terms of a concept of a service, this isn't a new thing. This has been around within certain organisations for a long time. And incredibly, through that organisation, they actually handle over 10,000 disputes a year. So it's by no means a very sort of small service. Actually, it's doing a lot. Um, it's obviously as a, as a service that they're providing, it's promoted as being quicker and cheaper than obviously going to court. Um, and actually, when it comes down to it, the individuals that you've got taking part in that mediation process, certainly from um, a charter surveyor perspective, you've got the professionals who know that trade actually taking part in that work. So you would actually hope that maybe the resolution, the, the, the outcome that comes from it has actually been handled by professionals that really do know the topic area that's being handled. Uh, in terms of the cost, I mean, that's one thing as membership bodies, we need to look at it. You know, how, how much are we charging for these kind of services if we decide to offer it? Well, RICs are charging between £100 and £750 per case. And uh, I think the cost really does depend on the actual complexity of the, the actual issue. Um, and for example, for them, they deal neighbour disputes, um, service charge disputes, agricultural rent reviews, all that kind of stuff. But it's really interesting to see that that body's actually really getting in there and handling it. Um, certainly when we, we look at this, I mean, there are other organisations, so for example, unsurprisingly, the Chartered Institute of Arbiters, they provided a dispute appointment service, a DAS as it's known, where actually within that membership body, you can go on their website, you can search for their members who will get involved in the process uh, and basically will um, basically enable a panel to come together to actually um, help that process. Um, I looked for another organisation, there was an organisation called Resolution, which was formerly the Solicitor's Family Law Association, um, and they've got a, a find a mediator service. So actually, although they're not actually providing the service direct, it sounds as if they're actually providing the opportunity to at least signpost people who can help with the process. Um, so moving sort of slightly away from maybe what would be more of the sort of traditional professions, um, certainly when I looked at the British Association of Landscape Industries website, they provide a service and it's very much one between consumers and providers. So, for example, designers, landscapers, uh, people involved in ground maintenance. Um, so, you know, outside of the professional body environment, you know, this stuff's still happening. Um, another big player seems to be the Institution of Civil Engineers, who again offer a dispute resolution service at a charge of £420. And it seems to cover a variety of different situations uh, and ultimately because of the professional bodies that are actually involved, you know, from architects through to engineers, uh, as a body for £420, they're actually getting involved um, in that process. So, so for me, I've not got all the answers. I certainly, <laughs> believe me, I, I'm here to find out more because from a membership perspective, I mean, I can get the fact that there's two key audiences that as, as membership and association professionals, uh, we've obviously got the consumer um, and we've obviously got our members and there are different, there are individuals and there are corporate entities. So I get that there's a real mix there and probably all sorts of little matrices of uh, mediation work that can go on there. So what, what I'm now going to do, um, if it's okay with you, David, is really just pose some questions. Yeah. And we, we might not be able to have an answer for these, but at least certainly from a membership and association perspective, we can get a little bit more of a feel of maybe whether it's something we should be providing as organisations yeah. and or the person or the organisations the benefits. So, so the, the first thing for me is um, in terms of mediation services from a membership and uh, an association professional uh, perspective, so as a service, you know, 
what is the value for the organisation? Why would we want to go and offer something like this? Well, I think from a, from a member's benefit, I think anything that enables members to be able to resolve their issues without the stress and the cost of formal process and litigation, I think has to be a positive thing. I think people are recognising, you know, I've got a, you know, I've got a six-year-old in school, and if they have an issue in the school now, they have a process called circle time, where they sit down in a little group and they talk about it. They do it every day and they talk about their issues. And my little one is being taught from an early age to have a voice, to speak out, mm -hmm. to talk about his issues. In fact, talking about speaking out, so Robert Francis QC, from the, he, he, he published the Freedom to Speak Out review earlier this year, is talking about the importance of mediation allowing people to speak out. So people expect to be given the chance to talk and speak out and to be heard. I think organisations, members, have that expectation as well. Mm -hmm. So for me, the value is giving people the chance to speak out, to be able to identify the root cause of issues at a much earlier stage, to avoid the cost and the harm and the stress of litigation. And I think it's a really important tool to be able to get, get organisations back on track. We've got the green shoots of economic recovery. Do we want to spend days and days in a courtroom or worrying about issues when our time would be much better spent? Mm -hmm delivering the services that we are there to deliver, whatever they might be. And, and in terms of, um, obviously, as, as membership organisations and associations, uh, in terms of, of what we represent and what we do, the idea that within a particular area, within a particular dispute area, we're bringing together the, the experts or people who actually have a real understanding of what the nuts and bolts of the kind of issue are, you know, I'm, I'm presuming that maybe you're going to get much more of an, an, an insight, if you like, a kind of a deeper kind of conversation with a with a potentially better outcome than in a kind of, I don't know, I've got a cold grey court feeling in my side, you know, but if it's within, yeah. for example, a professional body, at least there's this kind of understanding that you're talking to professionals and that it's not such a, uh, if, 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 you, if you like, a, a kind of a, a grey and cold and, um, and horrible environment. But that's the feeling. Absolutely. And not only that, Richard, I mean, what happens in the mediation process is it helps the parties to, uh, to resolve the dispute, which might be in relation to how they're engaging with each other. But in the conversation, they might find systemic or functional or organisational or cultural or other factors mm. that are impacting the organisation which are an antecedent to the conflict or in essence precipitate or cause mm. the conflicts to happen. So the mediation not isn't just adding value in terms of our two parties resolving their dispute in a more amicable way. Mm. It's actually then driving systemic change and learning within the organisation. And now this, is, now this is where it becomes very interesting. Mm. And actually the driver of change is through the parties themselves reaching a consensus. And I would suggest in that point, the conflict becomes not destructive or, 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 or negative, it becomes constructive and positive. Mm. And it's a transformation of the conflict mm. as a value add. So in terms, in terms of the actual membership organisation or association, they're actually playing an active role in actually improving a situation that has occurred within a particular profession, within a trade. Uh, it's about positive outcomes. So one of the other things that I've got as, a, as an issue, and, and um, certainly I was, wrestling, I was wrestling with this uh, with some colleagues the other day, is if we're offering mediation services, so say we go and choose to take this route, we actually set it up, we do it either ourselves or through... Um, through, a, through a third party specialist organisation. Yeah. What, what about, I mean, in terms of um, sort of membership bodies, particularly chartered bodies, royal institutes, that kind of element in, in terms of the professional body sector, uh, through our royal charters, for example, although our members might, might not always know it, mm. um, we're actually there to uh, improve things for the general public mm -hmm. and not actually improve things for our members you know we're not a we're not a club we're actually there to improve things in society so actually is there a bit of a conflict there because if if we're, if we're, if we're as organizations trying to do things for the general public you know is it right that as organizations suddenly we're creating a process of mediation where it might be seen that actually maybe we're siding with our members. Mm. And I'm trying to get my head around that mm. debate. So I don't know if there's a conflict there for, for, for membership organisations and associations. I think you just nailed the debate. And I think this is, a, this is a really important debate that needs to be had, Richard. I think, you know, I don't have all of the answers to that. But what I can say is whose interests are best served going through processes that are so formal and so damaging and and tear relationships asunder, particularly if there needs to be an ongoing relationship between the service provider and the individual concerned. Now, I would never impede or get in the way of formal regulatory processes uh, in the way that you're describing, but what I would be looking at is forging a debate and having that debate about how 
can mediation serve everyone's best interests ultimately? And that's a debate which I think is happening right now, and I'm really excited to be part of it. And I think it's about us listening to organisations and helping them to, to structure it. You know, I set up a mediation programme and we deliver the mediation services for the Health and Care Professional Council, ACPC, and we spend a lot of time looking at how mediation will work in that environment. Um, and that's we spend many hours in meetings thinking about mediation. Every single stage of mediation was process mapped. It needed to be done sensitively. It needed to be done carefully and compassionately. However, the mediation processes that we have done for that organisation have resulted in very, very positive outcomes for all of the parties. So it takes time, but it can, but it can work. And in terms of membership bodies, I mean, I know this myself. Obviously, you know, it's my day job, and I'm responsible for helping to provide member services. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'm all too aware of, and, and I'm sure um, that the people who, who who are here today will agree with me, as membership bodies, we don't want any more risk. You know, yeah. we're very at risk. Beasts. We don't like it. It doesn't settle well with us. And unfortunately, that kind of can turn some of the organisations within our sector to, to kind of quite quite bad bureaucracies. But I do see with this, you know, you've got two people, you've got two entities. There's clearly an issue or a problem that needs to be sorted out. Does mediation as a service present a risk? Or, or actually, is it an opportunity for, for membership organisations and associations? You know, do, do we want to, you know, for me, you know, if something's going wrong, I don't want to be anywhere near it. With, with mediation, hell, I'm bringing that into my building. Yeah. What, what do you think the, the, the um, what do you think the deal is with, with risk with such a, a service? Mm, I think it's a great question, really important question. But as a mediator, I guess you, you're going to expect me to maybe answer it this way, but as a mediator, and I've mediated in disputes that are toe curlingly bad. My experience is that when two human beings, two adults, sit in a room and talk to each other in a meaningful and positive way, amazing things can happen. And I would set that uh, to mitigate against the risk that you described. And of course, one needs to be um, uh, cognizant of the potential risk and to do things in a sensitive and compassionate way and also aligned with the organisation's values and the philosophy. But many organisations' values and philosophies aren't risk averse. The problem is we are told to be risk averse because of a minority of cases which actually could do harm and damage to the organisation. There might be, say, 10%. There's a 90% of cases where the parties just want to be able to get to some kind of an outcome. And what I would say that for an organisation is, yes, have your bureaucracy and your systems and processes well set out for the 10%, but what are you doing for the other 90%? Because they don't want the risk aversion, they just want to get on with their lives, whether it's as a consumer, a customer, an employee. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think it can dovetail in. And, and do you think in terms of different membership organisations, is are there particular, for, for example, sectors or, or, or um, professions or areas where mediation probably isn't something? I mean, if you, I mean, although we're saying obviously it's a good process, I mean, have you got any any particular areas where you think it, it might not be right? Does, does anything spring to mind? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any professions per se where it wouldn't would, would, wouldn't be right. I think where someone where there's a kind of fitness to practice issue or where there's been harm or there's a risk of harm, then clearly the organisation has a responsibility. To, 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 um, to act in a, in a particular way and that may not be mediation at that particular point but in terms of the use of mediation any organisation that works with human beings would benefit from some mechanism for those human beings to resolve their conflicts effectively well I think what I, my experience of you know, I set up a mediation scheme for Marks and Spencers and I set up a mediation scheme for Royal Mail they're both principles principles of mediation but those schemes are very 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 different mm -hmm. um, and so what I would say is any mediation program or in initiative needs to be designed around the organization it can't just be grafted on mm -hmm. as a one-size-fits-all and I think that that would be really okay. important and, and, and again I mean the, the other thing that, that uh, I was thinking about whilst I was on uh, on the way here today obviously you know we've talked about the process what it is mm -hmm. and we've just talked about how membership organizations um, you know can or should provide this kind of a service but I mean we touched on briefly you know, I'm, I'm looking here at the uh, the prices charged for these services yeah. uh, and, and in terms of organizations where you know profit is now or you know surplus is not a swear word for a membership body you know we yeah. need to do things to it to, to develop and grow yeah. um, I mean an organization so for example Ricks who's pushing through 10,000 disputes a year and charging up to 750 pounds for that service uh, presumably it can be 
an element of the suite of member benefits or benefits the organisation provides, uh, and it actually can be um, a relatively lucrative proposition. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I think I'm really glad you touched on that because I think it is. I think it's a really important potential strand to the to a business line for the professional body. Uh, it provides a good service to its members, and I think it could be lucrative in terms of generating revenues. Mm -hmm. um, a win-win-win perhaps. Okay well those are my killer questions yeah. David and I think you know you've answered those really well so so um, thank you for the opportunity and I think also thank you for the opportunity uh, for inviting me along today because it's really interesting for me to be able to pitch these questions mm. to you and hopefully uh, the people who have um, dialed into the uh, webinar today hopefully I've covered some bases but I understand we have some questions maybe towards the end but anyway yeah. that, that's my element so thank you very much. You are very welcome thank you very much indeed uh, Richard thanks for your, thanks for your presentation. So we have had a question, so let me just have a little look here and see what question we've got. So what was the strategy behind those two examples of setting up mediation programs? So Jessica, thank you very much for your question there. So both of those, I mean, we, we've, we've developed mediation programs in, in over 300 organisations and we've got a suite of case studies on our website from large and small, from retail, banking, public sector, the NHS and, and elsewhere. And the strategy and thinking behind those organisations is often driven by a desire to find an alternative or, uh, or more collaborative way of resolving disputes. Organisations might be picking up, as was the case particularly in, in, in Royal Mail and also to an extent within, within Marks and Spencer, a recognition that the formal grievance procedures that were in place within those organisations or bullying and harassment procedures weren't securing the kind of lasting outcomes that those organisations needed. And in respect of Royal Mail, there are very high profile problems within, within that organisation. But organisations may also think about issues from their employee engagement um, uh, surveys, people feeling disengaged and dissatisfied. Some organisations come to us because they've got a real problem with long-term or short-term absence, and that's often driven by stress, and the root cause of the stress is the conflict. And what we'll do is we'll work with the organisation to try and understand some of the issues. We'll do a detailed order, a resolution order within the organisation, talking to key stakeholders, talking to the holy trinity of employee relations, as I call them, the unions, the, uh, the managers and the HR professionals, bringing those three players into a room and asking them what do they need and what kind of organisation do they want to create in terms of how conflicts and disputes are handled. And I was at a meeting yesterday, uh, again with a, with, a, with a branch of Royal Mail Parcel Force worldwide I've been working with for a number of years now as part of Royal Mail Group and we've been working to develop together in partnership a mediation and dispute resolution program within that organisation and again we've got case studies around that work and they have driven mediation into their philosophy um, and into their in, uh, in, uh, industrial relations framework in a very creative way. So organisations are coming to mediation for a whole array of different reasons. Um, and yeah, it's very exciting, Jessica, it's, it's very exciting, but it has to be driven by understanding what the organisation's needs and goals are. Uh, we must never, as mediators, make assumptions about the situation or about the, um, the needs of the organisation. So Richard, thank you so much again, really appreciate that and uh, thank you Jessica for your question. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to, to pop those through. So can we have the links in those case studies to the slides you're sending through? Absolutely, uh, we'll send some documents and links out in case studies um, and without overwhelming you, uh, we'll get an email out in the next day or so. And we'll also send out the recording um, of the slides and uh, today's webinar. Good. Okay, so I think we've just I think we've touched on some of the questions. These are some of the questions I get asked a lot. What type of cases are suitable for mediation? Anything where the two parties are willing to get into a room together. And people often say to me, but the parties, you know, it's uh, you know they, they don't want to meet with each other. They're very resistant. And that's the real challenge: is how can we secure a commitment to mediate from from the parties when every fibre in their body is saying that they don't want to sit in a room with each other. Uh, and up to, I'm up to about 1,654 reasons why they should never mediate for every one good reason why I can give for them to mediate. And what we're trying to get the parties up to, Richard, is the golden grunt. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, one, one question I've got, yeah. actually, whilst we're on the, comp, the, yeah. the topic, I've not, not talked about this, but yeah. in terms of the mediation service, we're talking about maybe getting our members actually involved with uh, the process. Yeah. I mean, what in terms of actually involving our members, for example, what would, we, what would, what would they expect in return? Would it be voluntary? Would it be something they're paid to do? What about that? I mean, how, how, if we were to offer this sort of service, 
you know, what would there be an ex- what would be the expectation of remuneration for this kind of stuff? As a mediator? Yeah. That's yeah. an interesting one. So there's, again, there's lots of different models of mediation. So in the community, there's a big, I mean, my background is in community mediation and race relations. So that's in the early 90s. And there's a army, and it's probably the wrong view term, an army, you know, non-violence uh, in, uh, community of mediators, and they're the unsung heroes out there in, mm. in communities that are up and down the country, resolving labour disputes and so on and so forth. And they're not paid; their, their work is one mm. terms. There's people then like myself, who are professional mediators, who charge a fee for our services. Um, lawyers who, who who do the same. Mm. And somewhere in the middle is probably a hybrid. A lot of workplace mediation schemes are delivered by volunteers mm. who do it as part of their day job. But they receive benefits, they receive training and continuing professional development and support, and they do it because they believe in it and they want to be able to create a better organisation. And, and do you think, I mean, again, making it realistic, because mm. obviously I've, I've looked at this now, and in terms of RICs, you know, they're charging between 100 and 750 quid. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've got the Institution of Civil Engineers who are charging 420. Yeah. I mean, in terms of those sums, they're not massive amounts. Mm. So, I mean, presumably, I mean, and again, this is just for selfishly for me to understand. Yeah. I mean, in terms of mediation, would a professional body or a membership organisation say choose a day in the month and stack a day up with lots of different sessions to make it economical? With the power I have heard of that, absolutely no, that, I have heard of that being done, always having like a clinic structure. Yeah, yeah. It can work, um, again there's so many different models of doing it, but that approach can work because you know you've got your the resources you need, the mediators are available, the resources have been booked by the venue. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, so it needs to be a neutral venue, okay. um, and then basically all of the cases that I referred in that period are allocated to the mediation mm-hmm. in that particular case. And if you look at some of the uh, um, the, the court-based mediation schemes, it would work in exactly that right. way. Okay. But again, there's there's a mix, there's mixed modality. Um, what we are seeing increasingly is a rise of, rise of ODR, online dispute resolution, and that's okay. a really interesting area which I've not touched upon, but I do run webinars on online dispute resolution where we increasingly use in online uh, facilities um, and here at TCM we, we have a partner organisation called Odro who we work with and in essence we mediate virtually mm-hmm. and the parties won't come together or it might be a precursor to them coming together. So there's some really interesting ways of mediating, it might be telephone based, face to face, online. Right. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's fascinating. So the golden grunt I was talking about is <clears throat> I'll give it a go. So to get the parties to give it a go, it's about listening to them and recognising that they have these needs I talked about earlier. Listening to them, understanding their needs and helping them to identify the most effective route to resolution based on their underlying needs. And often they'll tell you in actual fact, you know something, the best way to resolve this is for us to get a room together. Mm-hmm. But that's not the first instinct. How much does mediation cost? Well, Richard, you've done a really good analysis there of the marketplace in terms of the cost. And how effective is it? As an organisation, over 90% of cases that we uh, mediate resolve um, effectively, that's a signed written agreement on the day. As I mentioned in Royal Mail Group, it's much higher than that as well. So it's overwhelmingly successful. I see statistics go from 80 plus percent. But anything that has an 80 plus percent success rate, for me, is, it, it's got to be worth consideration. So various possible resolution approaches that you might consider as an organisation. That mediation services offered as a benefit to your members. Obviously, putting ourselves out there as an organisation to work in partnership with, with 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 people who do want to do that, providing training for your members, um, so you know it's it, it, we can get someone in or do it ourselves. And I'm a big fan of do it yourself as long as you've been trained and you know what you're doing, and that's important. But it doesn't take weeks and months, years to train a mediator. It can be done in a couple of days. Perhaps you might have as a member organisation a trained team of your own mediators acting as a troubleshooting service going out to hotspots of, of, of complaints and disputes and going to resolve those. We've heard about some of those examples already today. And also having access to independent evaluation, arbitration and adjudication services um, so that you can have someone outside the organisation who provides that, that level of scrutiny and support as well as appeals processes. It won't come as any surprise for you to hear that TCM will provide all of those services for our customers. So final poll, and we're just coming to an end so uh, of the webinars, but the final poll is um, you know, based on what you've heard today, is this something that you would consider doing? Would you consider uh, setting up and developing a dispute resolution facility for your members? So uh, you've got the poll in front of you. It's a yes, no, or a maybe. Um, and I'll hand over to you to answer the question which most closely relates where you are.
Okay, so half of attendees have voted so far. So I'll keep the poll open for another five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now and share the poll. Well, the good news, Richard, is no one said no. Okay, well, 50% 50, 50 say maybe. That's a typical yeah. membership body yeah. response. <laughs> it's, good. it's good. It's a, it's a typical mediator's response. <laughs> uh, and 50% of you said yes. So that's wonderful news. So um, you know, for those of you who said yes, then let's, let's talk further about that and what can be done. Um, but clearly, it hasn't put anyone off, which is, <laughs> which is important. So thank goodness for that. Um, so like I said, we're coming to, to the end of the, uh, the session today. I just want to put this up there. We, we, you know, we're a small business at TCM. We, we, we do some fantastic work. So I just want to tell you a little bit about what we do. And if you're interested in any support or if there's a mediation case that one of you, that you're a dispute you're dealing with and you'd like to talk it through or get some help resolving it, then we're there to support. We provide a wide array of training. We provide the flagship accredited mediator training in the country, the National Certificate in Workplace Mediation, but we also provide a wide array of leadership and management courses, diagnostics and all that set up internal schemes. As I said, we provide the mediation services for HCPC, numerous, numerous other organisations, uh, and I've, I've mentioned some of those in the case studies. Final case studies, Marks and Spencers, you know, a big well-known uh, brand, so I'll just put it up there. In essence, I don't know if it's a case study or when Marks and Spencer say you stand out head and shoulders above the rest, you just feel like you've arrived. But, you know, it's nice to have got that accolade and positivity. And Marks and Spencer has been a fantastic organisation to work with, really passionate about driving the, um, uh, uh, the focus on mediation within that organisation. So I think we are... Um, at the end of the, uh, the webinar, I'd just like to say thank you so much for, for listening and for participating through the polls and through your questions. I'd like to say thanks again to Richard Gott from MemberWise. It's thank been you. a real pleasure having you here today. Thank you so much. And I think, Richard, one of the things I'd like to do, if, 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 you, if you'd like to as well, is just look at how can we maybe reach out and try and find out a little bit more from, for, from, from, from your members and from other organisations about, you know, is, is this tapping into a need? And maybe that's about going out and doing some more evidence gathering and some research. So that's maybe a conversation to have. In yeah, course. definitely. And, and with the participants who've taken part in today, you know, if, if they decide that they want to go on that journey, what would be fantastic would be actually to talk to them um, and, and just, you know, to, to, to see how it goes, really. So, yeah. I mean, what I would do is obviously encourage the representatives who we've uh, got dialing in today. Um, half of them are MemberWise subscribers, half of them aren't. Yeah. Uh, in terms of signing up to the network, you know, at memberwise.org.uk, uh, obviously, um, if, if we can take that forward, uh, they'll be the first to hear about it uh, as, as subscribers. So, yeah, Brilliant. thank you for the opportunity of speaking. Great stuff. Well, thank you so much. Well, uh, it's Thursday, but I think it's okay to have a happy weekend and a very pleasant weekend. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. I know it's not far away now, nearly Friday. So, thank you all very much. Thanks for attending and look forward to welcoming you to our next webinar. So, watch our website, thetcmgroup.com. Thank you all. Bye bye.